Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so everyone. much for joining. We're going to wait a few minutes to see if more people join and we'll start briefly. Bonjour Christian. Bonjour Anne-Sophie, tu vas bien Oui, c'est un plaisir de te voir. Oui, merci. Pareillement. J'espère qu'il va y avoir un grand succès des dizaines de participants. On avait 70 personnes enregistrées. Donc... Oh, pas mal. Hein? So, hi everyone. I think some people will join afterwards, but I think we can already start. Uh, th Thank you so much for joining our second webinar on the economics of nature-based solution. I'm May Magotti, the communications officer for BirdLife Europe and Central Asia, and I will be moderating this event today. Um, so for this uh, webinar to run smoothly, I will give you some instructions. So we have limited amount of time and have worked to ensure we have a good balance between presentation and exchange as well as Q&As. So to make sure we're efficient, we suggest you that if you have any questions during the presentation, you share them in the chat. Um, when we open the mics for Q&As, uh, you can raise virtually raise your hand and we will give you the floor. If you cannot manage, if we cannot manage to answer all of your questions, make sure to put them on the chat and we will reply it through email after the webinar. And I will please ask you during the presentations to uh, keep yourself muted. And this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the record of this webinar uh, after the event. So uh, before presenting the agenda and the speakers, I would like to remind everyone, uh, this is the second of a series of three webinars on the economics of nature-based solutions. And in case you were not here for the first webinar, or if you need a quick reminder, I will uh, give you a resume of what we discussed. So the aim of the first webinar was to introduce the concept of nature-based solutions and the purpose of assessing the economics of those solutions through cost-benefit analysis. Uh, we show the link between ecosystem services provision and nature-based solution implementation and had a quick introduction to the methodology uh, by presenting an overview of the step-by-step -step, um, process to uh, cost-benefit analysis and how is it key to bring conservation practitioners and policy decision makers together to improve nature preservation in ecological and econ economic planning. We also had two brilliant examples uh, um, from the field. So we, uh, we had the Sardinia case study that was presented by Vanya Statsu from METSI and by Yade Kavit's case uh, that was presented by, by Jesus Pinilla from SEO. So Vanya and Jesus will also present the result of this nature-based solution valuation in the next webinar uh, related to this project. So uh, please stay tuned. And uh, I will share right now on the chat um, the link to the recording of the first webinar as well as a link to access the PowerPoint presentation so you can have a closer look uh, afterwards. So for today's webinar, we have two goals. So the first one is to train uh, conservation practitioners and decision makers to easily assess the value of ecosystem services and their sites of interest under different land use or management planning scenarios, including nature-based solution scenarios, and also to give feedback on such methodology application. So then now we can have a very quick look at today's agenda. So we'll start with the first presentation on nature-based solution and benefits of nature interrelationship, following by the guiding principles of ecosystem services and nature-based solution assessment. And finally, uh, of, of the first part, we'll have a step-by-step -step assessment um, methodology. After these three presentations, we'll have a very quick break, 10 minutes, and we will resume with a presentation uh, that focuses on the cost-benefit analysis of nature-based solution. Uh, followed by a presentation on the application of the methodology to a real case study. And finally, we will talk about uh, communicating the data to decision makers and other policy stakeholders. After all this present amazing presentation, we'll have, of course, 15 minutes to discuss. You can ask your question, but also share your experience. Today's webinar will be presented by 
by two great experts that you, I think you all know. So Anne-Sophie Pellier from uh, BirdLife International and Selma Benzekri from Vertigo Lab. Anne-Sophie is a conservation scientist uh, with 10 years of experience in the science policy interface. She has been managing projects across Southeast Asia, Latin America, and Europe. Since 2018, she leads the work on ecosystem services for bird life and the de development of the toolkit for ecosystem service site-based assessment or TESA, which provides ecosystem service assessments methods for non-specialists. And Sophie strongly believes that sharing knowledge tools and methodologies is the best way to ensure we restore, protect and manage ecosystems such as wetlands while generating socioeconomic opportunities. Our second speaker is Selma. Uh, she's a consultant in environmental economy with a background in agronomy engineering in environmental management. She's hold, uh, she holds a master's degree in public policies and environmental strategy. Uh, Selma worked for the French Environment Ministry on environmental valuation of planning projects for Veolia's company, Environmental Plan, and has now joined Vertigo Lab to work on environmental public policies. Uh, tools, environmental perspective, biodiversity conservation, ecosystem services, nature-based solution, and subjects linked to environmental economy. And finally, we will also have a special contribution from uh, Chantal Menard. Uh, that is a she's a communication consultant, and she has been working as a communication manager and expert for more than 15 years on environmental issues in the Mediterranean. She's been managing communication strategies, implementing activities of all kind, and leading campaigns with WWF, um, FAO GFTM, uh, PAPRAC, MedWet, and many other organizations. And especially, she's coordinating the communication work for the Wetland Based Solution Project. So, ladies, the floor is. And um, thank you very much, uh, Naima. So, we are going to start uh, with our first. Uh, section of the presentation. So uh, what are the interrelationship between nature-based solution and the benefits of uh, nature? First, first of all, uh, let's try to see a bit of um, about the global policy context. So we all know that um, this decade is uh, a turning point uh, towards a global goal for nature. So governments, businesses, but also the global society need to recognize the value of nature. Um, and it means that uh, we need to have nature on the path of recovery by uh, 2030. And that, of course, needs to be done um, in parallel to the uh, UN uh, Climate Conventions, net zero emission that needs to be reached at least by uh, 2050. So governments need more than ever to really commit um, to nature positive by 2030, by taking urgent actions to halt and reverse natural loss right now until a full recovery uh, is done by 2050. So nature-based uh, solutions uh, have been seen as the main and central solutions towards those targets. Um, and there has been a growing interest uh, towards nature-based solution at the COP26 um, and COP15 as well for um, the new uh, global um, biodiversity framework. And with the IPCC report on the global climate change um, that actually shows that extension are actually accelerating and vulnerable uh, communities are also uh, at risk. Protecting nature is coming as a key uh, and invaluable thing to do. So we can actually increase our resilience to the worst impact of, of climate change and different societal challenges. So governments and businesses can actually help implement but also invest in nature-based solutions and that will protect, restore, but also manage nature and ultimately provide significant um, benefits of nature that society depends on. But what are nature-based solutions? The IUCN uh, defined them as actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural and modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So nature-based solutions are seen as a transformative and transitions to a sustainable balance between ecological preservation and ecosystem uh, resilience, but also with economical growth uh, that can be done through uh, sustainable provision of ecosystem services uh, to society. So what are ecosystem services? Well, they're all the benefits um, that are provided by nature to people at the local, uh, regional, but also national and uh, global scales. Um, and they bring human survival, economic, but also health 
and social uh, well-being. So the ecosystem services are produced as a result of ecosystem processing functions such as um, soil formation of primary production and they then flow um, to people in the form of benefits of goods that actually support uh, human well-being. So they can be um, classified into different categories categories, um, excuse me, um, and that could be, for instance, um, provisioning services such as uh, obviously wet goods, um, that could be also regulation and maintenance uh, services such as uh, carbon storage and global climate regulation or flood protection. And there are also uh, cultural services which kind of relate uh, to the connection that people um, have with nature and this contact actually contributes to, for instance, spiritual experience or uh, provide recreational enjoyment um, and actually have a positive impact on the long term health um, and happiness to people. So we've seen that nature based solution can address uh, the loss of ecosystem services and actually tackle um, climate uh, and societal challenges. And these nature based solutions are intertwined with ecosystem services and actually play a significant role um, in this uh, socio ecological system, as you can see in this diagram, that has been adapted from um, the paper of uh, Thedon and all. But here we actually adapted it to um, only show you it in the purpose to see that natural based solution can support ecosystems in having a greater uh, adaptive uh, capacity to actually counteract impacts from pressures such as floods um, that can alter its functions and processes, uh, but also um, alter the resulting flows of ecosystem services that actually provide socioeconomic benefits uh, to society. Um, so they need to be maintained uh, in the socioeconomic system. Um, so if implemented in the right way, the nature-based solution can actually increase the resilience of coastal system with the ecosystem services flow. Um, and they can effectively provide work opportunities, empower society um, and communities in conserving uh, ecosystems. Um, and we can have a balance with a socio and sustainable socioeconomic uh, development as well. So what does that mean in concrete terms? Um, here we present you with the uh, actions to address uh, coastline retreats. So of course, within your uh, site of interest, within your own um, study, the nature-based solution actions and implementation that you would want to see might be different um, depending on your goal and uh, really what you do really want to achieve. So here we present uh, an example uh, from uh, the Mediterranean Sea and Coast Foundation, uh, METSI, uh, who are uh, looking at uh, implementing uh, nature-based solutions to actually um, have a protection of their coastline. So I represent three different um, terms of nature-based solution and action. So the first is um, sustainable improved management for dunes protection, for instance, implementing some sand collectors, a dune rehabilitation with vegetation maintenance, for instance, um, so all about um, restoring and rehabilitating those vegetation that can also collect some sand. And uh, herbarium restoration in marine ecosystems, such as Posidonia oceanica, and that are um, massive carbon sink um, in these marine ecosystems. So you can see at the right side, all the uh, increase of the ecosystem services that such um, actions of natural-based solution can provide. So erosion, wind waves, storm surges, protection, for instance, of carbon storage and sequestration, uh, but also uh, cultural services and natural-based recreation and tourism uh, would also increase uh, from the connection that people would have with nature. So now we will um, look at the second uh, part uh, of the presentation today, um, and we wanted to give you a bit of a general guiding principles um, on ecosystem services evaluation. So what, what is actually an ecosystem services evaluation? It's a concept that uh, enable uh, to link ecological functions with socioeconomic activities and uh, human well-being that depend uh, on those. So the evaluation is a process of expressing value for a particular service uh, in a specific and certain context. So it could be a decision making, such as implementing a natural based solution. And uh, doing evaluation would help decision makers appreciate the value of nature and the consequences of loss uh, and degradation of natural habitats, but also the gain under uh, natural based solution actions. 
So it is important to uh, assess ecosystem services uh, if we are actually to estimate the effectiveness uh, in those nature-based solutions to actually increase uh, the benefits of nature and biodiversity. So why are we actually measuring and valuing ecosystem services? Well, that can really help you understand that individual sites, the impact of management or land use change on ecosystem services delivery, but also their beneficiaries. So it's not only about identifying um, how the site would be altered according to the policy or the management change um, you are considering at your site of interest, but it would also um, be a mean for you to indicate who would be the winners and who would be the losers in terms of beneficiaries as a result of any change in state of your site and the associated ecosystem services uh, provision. And uh, secondly, that uh, could be also for you to make a specific change on the ground to preserve ecosystem services and their generated um, benefits uh, to people. And of course, with those um, valuation in hand and results, you can uh, provide evidence um, to decision makers to identify proper actions um, that would optimize or maximize benefits um, provided by the breadth um, of ecosystem services um, and also avoid uh, potentially uh, significant costs or risks arising from um, this decision making. So um, that is uh, also quite important to do when you communicate the value of nature to decision making. Um, and the fourth point, uh, at more global scale, uh, you will be able to inform uh, policy decision makers in society on human well-being to achieve global uh, conservation objectives and planetary goals. So, of course, that will help prioritize uh, sustainable management and actions. So, you can actually um, assess your ecosystem services uh, in different ways. So you can do a biophysical assessment. So it means collecting a biophysical data of your um, specific uh, service. So here we present in the table um, different services and uh, different methods that you can use to collect a specific data and the biophysical units that will be generated from uh, this um, assessment. So, for instance, the water provision, uh, you may want to collect some use, um, the use of fresh water for domestic and industrial purposes. For instance, the units would be expressed in liters per hectare or a cubic meter per hectare. And the cultural services, for instance, if uh, you are collecting data about the cultural heritage or sense of place or identity and the connection that people have with nature, you may want to, uh, for instance, look at and collect data on the number of key landscape or wildlife uh, features. But you can also, of course, um, provide your um, ecosystem services value in monetary or non-monetary terms. So the monetary valuation is the practice of uh, really converting uh, measures of uh, your biophysical uh, data into monetary uh, units, and it is used to determine uh, the economic value of your service. So it is applied in cost-benefit analysis and to actually enable the comparison between uh, different scenarios. So the monetary values uh, may be most compelling for some audiences, such as finance ministries or uh, government funders, um, and they are actually frequently used to present the value in a more policy relevant way. And um, they are uh, kind of known to be uh, quite uh, a leverage um, to policy decision makers, for instance, so that they can change uh, the decision making. But uh, the non-monetary valuation assessment is still particularly important to see um, how specific ecosystem services, such as cultural services, um, that can capture actually specific groups in society and can also show what it actually means for issues such as poverty, equity, and justice. So it is therefore important not to limit your assessment um, to monetary values, but to include qualitative analyses and um, uh, physical uh, indicators such as quantitative ones as well. So within your ecosystem services approach, um, if you want to um, look at the effectiveness of specific action, you are actually valuing change. It means that you need to understand the impacts and of actual, but also the potential changes of a specific actions or land use, land cover on benefits delivery and their beneficiaries. And to do so, you would need to assess ecosystem services and their relative values at the site of interest to compare these estimates between uh, plausible alternative states. So here I've presented an example with uh, current states of a site. So this is a site um, 
um, in Spain, um, working with our partner, uh, so uh, BirdLife, uh, where they had uh, abundant salinas in the current state of the site and uh, looking at the uh, different values of ecosystem services between a scenario such as a business as usual uh, without actions and a nature-based solution scenario in which the salt marshes would be restored um, and improved in terms of management um, in a different state of uh, their site. So by doing this comparative valuation, decision maker can actually assess the net consequences of their decision and such as which benefits uh, may be lost or gained, and uh, they can actually make informed but also uh, evidence-based decisions on which options um, is the most beneficial, not only to people, but also for uh, biodiversity. And so we've seen that decision makers are likely to be concerned with social, ecological, but also economic consequences of their decision. Um, and they are looking forward uh, to cost-benefit analysis to understand uh, your ecosystem um, at your site and how it makes the value um, of a nature-based solution. But what is uh, cost-benefit analysis? What is the ratio between the benefits, the ecosystem services delivery that you would have to um, assess in the different uh, steps that we will show you afterwards, and the cost of implementation and management of different options as we've seen nature-based solution and the business as usual, for instance. So it is about um, understanding the economic return of investment in implementing and maintaining your nature-based solution as a whole. So within the um, ecosystem services assessment, um, and notably that you could use within the assessment of the benefit of values in your cost benefit analysis, uh, you may want to uh, use economic assessment methods and here represents four of them. And so for instance, you may want to use um, market prices methods. Uh, so they use the respective market. So if a good is traded and uh, uses the value of this good in the marketplace, or um, it uses the marketed equivalent price for goods that are non-traded um, in the market. And you will attribute this value uh, to the specific uh, service you are looking at. And for instance, that could be provision, uh, provisioning services um, using this method. For avoided costs, um, that would be um, all the costs that would be engaged if the ecosystem function uh, was not insured anymore. And um, so they are uh, usually used for uh, regulation services, for instance, such as coastal protection. Um, and uh, for instance, if a wetland protects um, adjacent property from flooding, then the flood protection uh, benefits may be estimated by the damages avoided if the flooding uh, would not occur. The replacement costs uh, represents the costs that would be incurred uh, if the functional ecosystem had to be restored or replaced. So it can be used to assess um, freshwater provision services, for instance, or regulation services. Um, for instance, uh, the flood protection uh, services of a wetland might be replaced uh, by, retaining, um, by a retaining wall or levee, and you will actually attribute the value of these costs uh, to your service. And the value of benefit transfer uh, is a method that uh, uses data from uh, other studies on similar and close condition of the ecosystems from your uh, site of interests. And it adapts this value to your uh, specific site. So it applies services when data are actually insufficient or not um, completely available. Um, you will need to be cautious when you use this uh, method um, and provide uncertainty and confidence um, of this method as well when you use uh, this one. So the type of valuation method um, that you will need to select for doing your ecosystem service assessment will really depend on the type of ecosystem uh, service that you want to value, uh, the quality of the data that you have in hand, uh, but also the breadth of data, but also what kind of resources you also have in terms of staff and uh, finances, for instance, to perform the collection and, and analysis and overall, there's key points that you need to um, also look at. Your data need to be locally relevant. You need really to ensure that a quantification of your services does not really uh, result in double counting. And you also need to consider inherent um, assumptions, caveats, but also the limitations of certain methods, such as the um, value uh, transfer. So as a summary, um, you will see that um, 
within your um, cost-benefit analysis, you would have a policy management actions, um, maybe reduce wetland degradation or increase preservation. Uh, you will look at your site with actions such as the nature-based solution without action business as usual. You will measure and value your ecosystem services in both of your and um, state of your site. You will also look at your costs of actions um, of your two states and you will subtract uh, those costs to um, the value of your ecosystem services. And that will provide you with a net economic value and on net benefit values of um, the nature-based solution state of the ecosystem to communicate to policy decision makers so that they can understand the net consequences of uh, their uh, decisions. So um, now uh, we are going to look more uh, into details of the step-by-step -step assessment methodology um, to go on with your ecosystem services assessment um, and looking at your um, cost benefit um, analysis after that. Um, today we focus on coastal ecosystem uh, only. So the methodology and step-by-step, -step, you will have uh, five main steps uh, to follow. So the first one is all about identifying and uh, characterizing your ecosystem services, looking at your site boundaries and also um, your ecosystem services identification and beneficiaries. The second step is about your economic valuation um, of your ecosystem services. And so also you will look at translating your biophysical data into monetary values. Third step uh, would be the benefit valuation of your nature-based uh, solution action. So we need to start to elaborate um, your nature-based and business as usual scenarios, and you will use also a specific time frame uh, for those state of your site. The step four is the cost estimation um, of your two states, so nature-based solution and business uh, as usual. And the fifth steps is the summary of your, uh, doing your analysis of cost uh, benefits. So overall, within all your steps, you will need really to engage a stakeholder. It is really key to do so. And so as a summary at the end, uh, what you're going to do is assess your ecosystem services in the current state of your site at T0, and then you will do the same for the business as usual and uh, natural-based solutions. And you will need, of course, um, to find a specific time frame <clears throat> that would be the same for the business as usual and a nature-based um, solution. And what you will actually um, assess is actually the nature-based uh, solution and the benefits value when you do the comparative valuation between your two states. So um, just before we talked about stakeholder engagement and you need to do so uh, within the overall um, of your step, um, it is primary uh, when you uh, start your study at the very first beginning. Um, this diagram uh, has been shown in the first webinar. Uh, so if you want to um, have more details, just um, advise you to uh, watch the first webinar and um, go on with uh, looking at the diagram that he's explained. Um, I'm going to summarize it um, quite quickly. So you have in the x-axis interest and importance of stakeholders and then the power and influence that can have your stakeholders. So you have some stakeholders that will only inform and uh, they are actually of low priority. And then you will have those uh, that have a lot of power but less interest into your studies. So you will have perhaps to find some ways to push them towards more collaboration with you um, if they have to, um, to have some power to actually uh, make a decision for your uh, site. Um, and then you would have these stakeholders that needs to be really closely um, uh, look forward for a specific and close collaboration with. Uh, so the relationship with them will need to be uh, developed and um, a trust will need to be also um, built uh, between you and the stakeholders. They can also help you to um, actually provide you with secondary data and help you through through study or some specific analysis. So these stakeholders um, can really help you to um, with their ecological knowledge. They can also give you the list of the main important ecosystem services or the list of beneficiaries um, so that you don't miss uh, any stakeholders out. Uh, they can help for cross collaboration and support you through your study. Um, and actually you can actually build trust and they can actually help them 
um, these stakeholders to be empowered within your study and help you achieve even future projects afterwards. So policy decision makers, businesses, local communities, even um, journalists uh, within the area would be very good to engage at the beginning of your project. So regarding all the different steps now, um, so we've seen the step number one is site context and diagnosis. So it's all about uh, looking at your site boundaries, characterizing also your habitats, identifying your pressure and threats, so all the context of your sites, um, identify current practices and possible nature-based solution uh, actions. You need to also classify and prioritize the services or so select uh, them and contact and uh, follow up with uh, stakeholders on this. So you will, of course, need to look at what is really your goal. What are you actually trying to change? Um, is there any um, decisions or policies uh, that you may want to influence? Is there any existing management plan in place? Uh, or what kind of level of decision making you're actually targeting? Um, and which stakeholders uh, do you really need to involve? So uh, it means of beneficiaries um, and think of these beneficiaries at low local, national, but also global scale, what kind of audience you need to reach and uh, who are the decision makers. Within this, step, this first step, you will need to um, identify the different habitats within your sites of interests um, and uh, also look at which habitat contribute to which service. So you have different uh, tools here um, using a GIS uh, to help you do uh, your mapping and looking at your uh, land use and land cover classes. The second step is economic valuation of ecosystem services. So for each of them, you will need to look at uh, what kind of data actually um, available uh, for the assessment um, and which valuation method is the most pertinent and which one you need to select. At the end, you will also have the annual uh, monetary value for each of your um, service. So for each of the category of the service, you will be able to sum the value um, of all uh, these services. And you will need also to look at which services may perhaps not have been assessed within the, the valuation. And perhaps you can find um, justification of it if you need to uh, report or provide and present uh, your results to uh, specific key uh, stakeholders. So, this economic valuation uh, really help you quantify the amount of ecosystem services, but also, as we've seen before, uh, provide you with a net economic value um, at your site of interests. Um, and uh, you will need to collect necessary data for this assessment. And those are, as we've seen before, qualitative, quantitative, but also uh, monetary uh, data. So um, now we're going to present you some specific services and uh, we have focused um, our presentation in um, more regulation um, services. So the global climate regulation, for instance, so we present you with a table where you can have qualitative, quantitative, but also a transformation in monetary uh, value. So qualitative um, assessments of uh, global climate regulation and data could be the um, habitat classes that we've just seen in the step one, uh, different vegetation can uh, store and sequester uh, carbon differently, for instance. The quantitative data uh, can be, uh, you know, if you want to assess your carbon stock uh, or the greenhouse gas uh, fluxes, and you may want to um, transform this uh, biophysical data in terms of monetary value. So you would have a carbon price per ton and to estimate the value of carbon stock, and that would be exp um, exp estimated, sorry, in euros, and then your greenhouse gas fluxes in a euro ton um, of uh, dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide equivalent, or euros um, per ton of carbon. So I just uh, give you here an example of um, carbon stock. If you want to assess it, um, collecting the data in the field, uh, you can do so. Um, I am not going to go into details, but just know that um, the uh, toolkit uh, for ecosystem service uh, site-based assessment uh, or TESA provides you with some um, methods to actually assess uh, this uh, service, so uh, carbon stock, um, but also um, uh, everything related to carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas uh, fluxes um, uh, in this toolkit of TESA. So if, for instance, for instance, your wetland is non-forested, uh, you would um, assess your above ground biomass uh, using climate uh, method three, for instance. 
Um, an example of carbon uh, stock example, uh, assessing above and below ground uh, biomass. Uh, if you uh, only um, have secondary data and you rely only on that and you can't go to the field, uh, you would uh, actually uh, assess your uh, above ground biomass by looking at the biomass in dry matter. So you can have some field studies or you can look at the IPCC as well. Um, you will need to multiply, of course, uh, these um, tons of dry matter per hectare by the norm, the size of your habitat type. That will be explained in uh, hectares. And there is a conversion uh, factors uh, to actually convert your tons of uh, dry matter or biomass um, in tons of carbon. And so it really depends on, on your habitat and the IPCC um, report actually provide you with that. So once you have this, uh, you would have um, uh, the value of your above ground biomass in each of the habitats, and then you sum the value for all the habitats. So you will have the units in tons of carbon. For the below ground biomass, uh, you would have to use the above ground biomass in each habitat that had been actually assessed here in tons of dry matter per hectare. You would multiply again the habitat the type in hectares um, um, in, um, within your GIS uh, analysis, for instance. And here you will use a conversion factor to actually transform um, the ratio between the uh, above ground biomass to a below ground uh, biomass. So the IPCC can uh, also help you uh, do so. So again, you will have the below ground biomass in each habitat, you will sum the value for all the habitats, and then you will have your uh, total carbon of below ground biomass expressed in tons of carbon. And to get the monetary value of this, uh, you can um, sum your above ground and below ground biomass and within your, your site, and then you multiply uh, the tons of carbon uh, by uh, the carbon price in euros per ton. And you would have the stock value actually explained in euros. And of course, all these steps, you will need to do that in your current state of your site, in the business um, as usual, and the, the looking for uh, the nature-based solution state as well. So now my uh, colleague Sanma uh, will take the stage to present you other uh, regulation services. So uh, hello everyone. Uh, so as uh, Anne Sophie said, um, I will follow up uh, the presentation with the ecosystem services assessment and cost benefits analysis after. Um, and I will share the method uh, first uh, on storm surges. Um, so storm surges correspond to the rise uh, in seawater level uh, caused by a storm and usually leading to flood uh, events. And natural ecosystems uh, usually have a role in limiting uh, those kind of events by providing a protective service to the, to the area. Uh, so here, uh, the table gives you an idea of uh, the data that can be required uh, for assessing this service. Uh, again, the, the data listed here is not exhaustive, but it, it gives you an idea of the type of data you will need. In terms of qualitative data, you can look at the ecological role of uh, the uh, habitats. It can provide a buffer effect or a sprawl effect. Uh, the role that the natural habitat has in case of uh, flood or marine submersion. Um, also, the, um, the built structures or housing typology that you can find on the site. Um, then in terms of quantitative data, uh, you can look at the water storage capacity of your site. Uh, sometimes the value can be found, sometimes you can calculate it. Um, then the area of your wetland, the flood frequency, the wave height, uh, or again the, the area of the build structures that are concerned by the flood damages. And in terms of monetary data, uh, you can look at the costs of damages estimated from past damages that happened, or again the unitary costs of uh, houses concerned by the submersion of the flood events. So the first method I will present here is the avoided damage costs. Uh, it consists in calculating the costs of damages uh, caused by storm surges by considering uh, the capacity of uh, a natural site to store water and hence avoid those costs. And for this method, you will need some precise data on hydrology or G and GIS treatment as well. 
uh, so for this for applying this method you will need to multiply the water storage capacity of your site uh, with the area of the habitat providing the water retention service to get the storage cap capacity of your ecosystem uh, in volume so in liters or cubic meters and then uh, you can get an estimate of the damages costs uh, that are caused uh, by the storm surges in euros or monetary value per hectare and you can usually get this in predictive models or sometimes in financial reports or newspaper articles for example um, then with the volume of the water possible to be stored found before you can simulate uh, with a gis treatment tool, uh, how much built area would be submerged if your habitat were not here to have a sponge effect and store water. And this leads to the damages costs avoided in monetary terms. Um, and to get a yearly value, you can divide this uh, the, 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 the figure you get uh, with the return periods of such events um, and you obtain the value of storm surge reduction in monetary value per year. So here uh, we also uh, apply these uh, methods uh, to a case study. Sorry, I'll come back. I can come back uh, to the previous, uh, no. Yeah, we applied uh, this uh, to a case study uh, in the north of France, so I will not detail here the, the example, but you can come back to it uh, later on if you if you need. Uh, then uh, the, the next service uh, presented here is the coastal erosion protection. Uh, and I will give you some insight on how to make uh, the economic assessment of uh, this service. So coastal erosion corresponds to uh, the loss of land or removal of sediments, uh, rocks uh, along the coastline due to the action of waves, currents, uh, tides, etc. And natural areas can help protecting economic activities from uh, this natural phenomena. Um, and the, the type of data uh, that can be needed here uh, is can be qualitative. So the ecological role, uh, again, um, description of uh, natural barriers, uh, the damages that you can observe on the soft substrate on your coast, the infrastructure that has been built or could be built to limit erosion, such as spikes or dikes, uh, and some information about the storm surge uh, intensity. In terms of quantitative data, you can uh, look at the coastline retreat or progress in meters per year. Uh, so the so the speed of uh, the coastline retreats, uh, the area or length uh, of built structures that are concerned by the flood damages, and the eroding storm occurrence. And in terms of monetary data, you can look at the cost infrastructure, the cost of infrastructure that uh, can be built to limit erosion, the costs uh, of uh, maintaining and the management costs uh, for this infrastructure, uh, the costs for planning and support works to limit erosion effects, and the damages costs that can be generated by the swell and storm events that are participating in uh, eroding the coastline. So the first method here is the avoided, avoided damage costs, which consists uh, again in calculating the cost avoided uh, that would have been caused by a swell eroding uh, the, the coastline. And for uh, this method, uh, you first have to characterize the intensity of the swell or, or storm event eroding the coastline and estimate the frequency of such storm or swell uh, to have the occurrence of such uh, intensity events. And then you have to multiply it by the costs um, generated by such events. So for example, the cost to rebuild infrastructures damage, uh, etc. to get, uh, and you get uh, the service value again in Euro or monetary, uh, monetary unit per year. Um, here we also, um, apply this to um, to 
would uh, study in uh, the top pond in the south of France. Uh, and you can look at the, the value which is, uh, which is calculated here for this case study. Another method um, here is, um, is uh, the, the replacement costs. Um, so, sorry, I think we, yeah. No, so the, the method presented here uh, is the, um, the, the defensive infrastructure costs. Uh, so for this method, you will have to investigate uh, on the expenditures uh, and understand uh, for which time period those uh, expenditures um, and those, um, those infrastructure could last. Um, so to get uh, an idea of the lifetime of uh, such infrastructure. Uh, then you may obtain the service value uh, in the euro area. So the, this, uh, this method is quite uh, straightforward and quite simple uh, if you have the data. And it was again applied to a case study uh, in the French North region of Somme uh, to get the, the service value. And the next uh, um, method uh, presented here is uh, the replacement cost method. Um, and it consists uh, in calculating the price of a hypothetical infrastructure that could provide the same uh, ecological function than uh, the natural site you're assessing. And for this, you will have to find the price per surface uh, considered of such infrastructure and divided by the infrastructure lifetime. And then uh, you will have to multiply it by the area of your habitat providing uh, this uh, ecological function to have the, the service uh, value in uh, euro per year. Uh, so here again, we apply this case uh, for a site uh, in uh, French uh, and he, uh, in Martinique, uh, where the service was uh, performed by and provided by the mangrove. And we can see that we obtain a, val a high value of 9.66 uh, million euros per year uh, for the service of coastal erosion. And finally, uh, the last method presented here, and uh, Anne-Sophie uh, talked about this method before, uh, can be applied to any um, any uh, service, uh, and uh, it's really the last one to use uh, only if none of the previous methods uh, presented before uh, can be applied. And the pr principle of uh, this method is uh, to transfer the values calculated from previous studies on your site or on for um and uh, here are some uh, sources where you can find the data uh, which is uh, usually expressed in uh, euros per hectare and per year uh, so those are only examples uh, of um, sources you can where you can find data uh, you can find other studies uh, sometimes that uh, are close to your site or that uh, that are for a similar site uh, and you have to bear in mind that this method really relies on hypothesis and implies uh, some bias, as it supposes that uh, your ecosystems function exactly the same as the reference ecosystem considered uh, for the transfer. Um, and also, uh, you have to know that you will not uh, always find exactly the data looked for, uh, and you will have to adjust uh, the data to your site, for example, here uh, by multiplying uh, by the area of your site. And uh, this uh, enables you to get uh, um, an assessment, an estimate at least of uh, the ecosystem service value in euro per year or monetary value per year. Thank you, Salmine and Sophie. So now we're going to go for a very quick break. We will start again at uh, 3 p.m. sharp. So I suggest you just cut your cameras and put your mics on mute, but just don't close the Zoom call. 
So have a nice break, uh, all of you, and we will see each other at 3 uh, p.m. sharp.
So welcome back, everyone. I hope you had time to grab a tea or a coffee. Um, I'll leave the floor again to Selma to continue the presentation on cost-benefit analysis of nature-based solution. So Selma, the floor is yours. Uh, Selma, I, I cannot hear you. I don't know if. Uh... Sorry, I, I have some technical issue. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Can you can you see me? Uh, I think yeah, maybe yeah. We, we can okay. see you. We can hear you, and there's a presentation as well. Okay. Uh, so it's just my screen. <laughs> Uh, so here um, I will uh, follow up with uh, the details of uh, the costs and benefits uh, analysis and the methodology for this. Um, and so if we look here at the overall process, we are going to step three, where we will have a prospective vision on the services uh, assessed for the project of NBS you, are, you may have or you want to have. So for this, uh, to measure the benefits uh, of your NBS actions, you should have a long-term vision, which is called a prospective vision. And that way uh, you can elaborate and characterize uh, future scenarios. Uh, so the goals of these steps are to elaborate and characterize future alternative scenarios for your site and estimate also their impacts on the services and people benefiting from those services who are called the beneficiaries. Uh, so for assessing this and uh, elaborating your scenarios, you should organize a workshop uh, and co uh, consultation uh, with, uh, with uh, key stakeholders for this task. And for, uh, for this, we listed uh, below uh, here on the screen, the key concepts of perspective uh, that you have to keep in mind. So first, uh, you will have to elaborate possible or impossible future scenarios, considering uh, the current perceptions of the area. And remember here that this exercise uh, is prospective and it's not projection or prediction. So no errors are possible. You just have to imagine what could be happening uh, on your site. Uh, uh, you will have to set a time horizon. Uh, so uh, to imagine and build your future scenario. Uh, so that can be 20, 25 years, 30 years, for example. Um, and imagine uh, the future uh, at this time horizon. Um, then another key concept and key uh, idea is to ensure the coherence uh, between the evolution of your ecosystem services state evolution. And for this, you will have to call for ecosystem services uh, specialists uh, and consult them uh, to ensure that your hypothesis uh, can uh, be valuable and are coherent. Um, so for this consultation, you can organize, uh, organize uh, the workshops uh, with identified specialists uh, where you will have a role of moderator be between, for example, uh, services experts, uh, site managers, uh, the people you interviewed uh, for the site diagnosis, for example. And you are really here to ask them the right questions for a prospective uh, ecosystem services assessment. Um, and you, you will um, really have to understand how NBS could be uh, or, could, uh, or wouldn't be interesting for the future evolution of your services. Uh, and uh, the key uh, goal of this um, the, the step is to elaborate a consensus, uh, taking all parts into consideration. So um, if we go more in the details of the scenario constructions, uh, the workshops organized should uh, help you define them better. 
Uh, and for the specific case of NBS here, you can consider two scenarios. So for example, we uh, put the business as usual scenario and the NBS scenario here, but you can have a statu quo scenario, a best case scenario, worst case scenario. Um, and then you will have to characterize the scenarios implications. Uh, so um, within which amount of time uh, you want to consider them. So that's the time frame. What is the ultimate net natural health goal um, uh, targeted by the management operation? Uh, what are the site man management operations that you want to do? Um, how will the habitats, uh, natural habitats, answer the, the, the management operations? Uh, also, what are the pressures and the threats uh, in, in the long term um, on the natural sites? Uh, what are the impacts on the ecosystem services provision or the ecosystem services quality? Um, and we will uh, detail uh, the the methodological aspects of the workshop uh, in the following slides. Um, so um, when you organize your workshops, you will ask participants to estimate uh, for each service how the service uh, has evolved in the past and how it could uh, be evolving in the future. Um, so this uh, estimation could be qualitative or quantitative according to the type of data uh, that people have and that you can have. And based on this, you can build uh, your scenarios. And this enables uh, you to translate the scenario implications in terms of services evolution in percentages or in surface area vari variation. So here on the right of the screen, uh, we give you a tip for this translation by asking participants to estimate the evolution with a plus or minus. And this enables to avoid giving real values uh, to be sure that stakeholders can express uh, their values and their assumptions of the site evolution. So, for example, they can say if the service is going to be deteriorated or improved, and will this deterioration or improvement be light, moderate, severe, or even if the, the, the evolution uh, just there is no evolution and the, the, there is no variation. And we have here an example of of um, of uh, what we applied uh, the, this the methodology we applied uh, for coastal erosion on storm surges, uh, asking actors to assess the evolution of services in several future scenarios. One business as usual uh, scenario, which is uh, in orange, and one uh, NBS implementation scenario, which is in green. And to help the participants of the workshop to uh, make their estimation of the evolution of each service, we ask them uh, some questions such as uh, if, the co if they uh, have observed that the coastline was more and more eroded uh, in the last uh, few years, if some events, uh, maybe some storms uh, have uh, encouraged erosion, and if this erosion is more and more frequent or stronger in the last years, um, on also what may be the evolution of um, the coastal erosion in the next uh, 30 years, according to their, their knowledge, their observations, um, and also uh, what they think that an NBS implementation would have in terms of consequences uh, on the Reading events or on the storm surges. Um, so with this information, uh, we obtained, uh, and you can obtain information and understand how your services will evolve uh, with time. And for example, here uh, we see on the left um, how um, in a business as usual scenario, uh, there it would it was estimated that 80% of 
the coastal wetlands uh, will be lost. So uh, we made the assumption that uh, the capacity of the coastal wetland to retain water to avoid storm surges uh, will decrease by 80%. Uh, on the right, in an NBS scenario uh, that was uh, built here, uh, you will gain 10% uh, of coastal wetland. So those habitats will gain also 10% of the capacity to protect the shore and avoid coastal erosion. So with this, you can get the total value of uh, the ecosystem services uh, actualized with the evolution of the ecosystem services provision on the, in the long term uh, for your two scenarios. And this corresponds to the, the total benefits um, of uh, ecosystem services. So now um, the next step uh, here is to estimate uh, the costs of uh, the NBS. Uh, so the nature-based solution um, and of the other scenario to understand uh, the concrete implications of uh, nature-based solutions versus con conventional uh, infrastructure and conventional solutions. So we are in uh, step four of uh, our global methodology. The goals of uh, these steps are to study the costs of implementation, management, and maintenance of uh, nature based solution. Um, and for each scenario, you should estimate uh, those costs in the long term by being the most exhaustive possible, still uh, paying attention to avoid the uh, double counting in, in, the, in the accounting. Uh, and for example, you can uh, look for costs about investments, so the costs at the beginning of the operation, such as land acquisition, uh, planning studies, planning works, uh, the preparatory remediation management you would have to do if, for example, the area was polluted, uh, or any legal fees that are to be paid uh, uh, for the acquisition of your site. Um, and uh, in terms of maintenance and management costs, uh, you can consider it in uh, monetary value per year. Um, and this can contain any monitoring studies on the site, the long-term management uh, actions, uh, the project protection, the risks monitoring, uh, the nature, nature quality monitoring fixing, or the salaries of people performing the maintenance works. So those types of costs are not exhaustive. Again, uh, the idea is really to be the most uh, complete possible and consider all the costs that can be uh, um, taken into consideration during the whole project uh, lifetime. Um, and so when you have all this data, you have all the data to uh, do your costs and benefits analysis uh, at the step five of uh, our methodology presented here. Um, and so the final step here is really to put the costs and benefits together to make a cost benefits analysis and state if you NBS is relevant on the economic point of view. And that way, uh, you can, uh, for the considered time frame, you can compare the costs and benefits in each scenario to see the most interesting one. Uh, for the benefits, so on the left side, uh, you will ask yourself uh, how much does the site represent in terms of economic services value. And you will have to sum all the benefits calculated uh, before in the ecosystem services assessment. And for the costs, you will have to sum all of uh, the costs uh, you found for the time per period uh, considered also. So you all, of course, have to take the same time period for the costs and the benefits. And that way, you can assume uh, if it is uh, worth or not uh, investing in an NBS uh, in the long term, so in the, the time frame of the project uh, you are considering. 
Thank you very much, Selma. So now we have a few minutes if you want to ask any questions. So feel free either to raise your hand or unmute yourself or talk in the chat. Just keep in mind that this is one of our Q&As. We'll have another one at the end of the webinar. Uh, so you also have another opportunity to ask questions or share experiences. Uh, yes, Costas, go ahead. Hello, uh, this is Costas from Corfu, Greece. Um, I have a question first as for the um, uh, something um, presented in the first presentation as for the methodologies. Um, so <clears throat> it was mentioned that uh, we have to pick among um, four um, uh, for one of four methodologies, if I understood correctly, um, depending on what we, you know, what what the goals are, what the, the overall uh, um, situation is, etc. Uh, but I wonder if I don't remember the exact terms uh, right now. I didn't write them down, but um, I wonder if uh, it's because this whole methodology seems like um, the usual uh, cost benefit cost benefit analysis methodology i wonder if it's um, uh, possible that we we just uh, combine uh, methodologies and that we you know we we take into account as many factors as possible um, uh, when we we design when we design this uh, sort of study um, so that it becomes very analytical. And um, so is it, um, it was something in the, in the first half of the first presentation about the methodologies, because I'm not sure I'm being understood now uh, because I, I cannot recall the, the exact terms. Um, I, I may take this one. Um, um, thank you very much for, for the question. Um, so the methods that we uh, actually present here is uh, a non-exhaustive list, of course, and it is true that when you do your ecosystem service assessment, um, because your um, different methods provide you with different robustness and sometimes uh, a certainty or even bias, it's sometimes quite useful to use different methods uh, for assessing a specific service. Um, and compare actually uh, what are those values with different methods. And, and this is how you can come up with uh, sometimes um, more relevant methods uh, to all the ones in specific uh, context, for instance. So it's a, a variable question that you have uh, I've asked here. I'm hoping that answer your questions. If not, please um, go back and, and let us know. I think it's fine for now. So any other questions? Uh, if not, we can we can move on with the presentations. And as I told you before, you, we will have another Q&A session at the very end of the webinar. So if you have any questions, keep them in mind or put them on the chat and we'll go back to them uh, at the end of the presentations. Uh, so now we will resume with a presentation about the examples of the cost benefit analysis, the saline restoration in Camargue followed by a presentation on communicating data uh, to decision makers. So Salma, the floor is yours. Uh, now uh, we will present here a case study uh, on cost-benefit analysis uh, in Camargue. Uh, I will show you, um, so it's uh, uh, a case studies that was made uh, in the for the Sarai restoration in the south of France uh, in Camargue. Um, and uh, this case study is interesting uh, because it's uh, really going uh, quite far for the cost study. Um, but uh, just to, to tell you, uh, we did not go in the details of the ecosystem services assessment here. It's only a qualitative assessment uh, made in this case study. Uh, so first, uh, to, to take the steps that we presented before, uh, we made the site diagnosis here. So first, we, we made the diagnosis of the 
the site uh, in uh, in the region and so the costs uh, present uh, really interesting habitats in in terms of uh, ecological uh, functions uh, there are salpens uh, coastal wetlands uh, with interesting uh, biodiversity and uh, uh, providing uh, interesting um, ecosystem services um, the site is also quite threatened by the sea level rise um, there is a uh, 70 percent of the territory which is under one meter height and the sea is still expected to rise uh, over one meter by 2100 so it's a really threatened uh, area um, the site is also uh, exposed to the threats of uh, climate change such as uh, extreme me meteorological phenomena uh, coastal flood uh, heat waves droughts and others and other natural risks are threatening the the salines that are in the areas um, such as erosion uh, marine submersion etc so here we consider the two scenarios to be assessed. Uh, first, the NBS scenario, uh, which is the salines uh, restoration, mm -hmm. and uh, then the business as usual scenario, which is the dike rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. For the second step, as I as I said before, uh, here we we show the the ec major ecosystem services that are expressed uh, as the site uh, qualitatively. So indeed, uh, the salines are very interesting uh, natural habitats and, and uh, uh, provide a, a variety of ecosystem services. Um, so the, there are support services such as biodiversity support, uh, but also provisioning services uh, with the salt production and also uh, apiculture uh, that is done on the site. Uh, the the salt pond also uh, provide regulation services such as erosion and coastal flood protection, um, the regulation of nutrient and water cycle, uh, also uh, storing uh, uh, carbon for global climate regulation and Finally, the, the salpens uh, can provide uh, cultural services such as ecotourism, and uh, they also host uh, traditional activities such as hunting or fishing, but also research and education uh, activities or recreation activities. Um, and we looked a little bit at the the benefits that each scenario could uh, have in terms of ecosystem services and even other services uh, on the area. And uh, we considered first the benefits of the NBS scenario, which is uh, the restoration of the salines with a hydraulic reconnection um, and uh, the, the construction of a small inland dike to protect uh, the salpens. And the ecosystem services that uh, uh, would be enhanced uh, thanks to these actions are uh, support services. So uh, enhancing biodiversity, birds, uh, local protected uh, fauna and flora uh, as habitats would be restored. Um, also regulation services. So um, salines uh, can have a buffer and spalling effect uh, enabling to reduce uh, coastal flood and er erosion, for example. Uh, there is also the global climate regulation, which uh, which would be um, provided. So by enhancing uh, vegetation, uh, car carbon sinks uh, would be maximized and participate uh, in carbon storage and global climate regulation. Um, and also nutrients and water cycle regulation would be provided uh, in uh, this scenario. And finally, in terms of cultural services, uh, uh, the salines uh, can hold a diversity of uh, activities such as ecotourism, traditional activities, um, but also uh, educative, uh, the salines can be uh, and represent educative materials for children or even for research activities. Uh, the services uh, enabled by this scenario uh, would be also uh, protection uh, against erosion on 
broad. So that's services, that's important services for human activities and human life in general. For the business as usual scenario we considered, so this is more um, conventional infrastructure that is uh, considered here. Uh, the actions were only to rebuild a uh, great dike and implement spikes uh, on the coast, uh, on, the coast on the whole coastline considered. Uh, and this scenario would enable to protect the area. Uh, so there are several cities uh, uh, and urban areas that would be uh, protected. Um, and the economic activities could also uh, benefit uh, from uh, this protection. Uh, so the cultivated lands uh, would be protected, the breeding activities also, um, and also the, the industrial activities uh, such as the salt production, the harbor, the, the storage of uh, petrochemicals would be would be protected here. Um, and in the meantime, uh, the, 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 the dike uh, would uh, enable to, to protect the, the whole area. Um, so for this uh, scenario, we also evaluate uh, the costs uh, in quite some detail um, for the two scenarios and we for this we we made interviews with the concert actors uh, in their area and we looked uh, first for the NBS scenario uh, we counted the hydraulic uh, the for the investment costs uh, the hydraulic reconnection uh, which costs about uh, 1.5 million euros and the small uh, inland dike uh, which would have to be to be uh, built uh, and which would cost uh, about 7 to 13 million euros and for the maintenance costs uh, we will have uh, the inland dike which would cost uh, 80 to 140 thousand euros per year um, and the management costs uh, over of uh, other activities uh, such as the hydraulic infrastructures, uh, maintenance costs, or uh, the other monitoring activities um, were uh, assumed as being negligible compared uh, to the other amounts that uh, we count here uh, in the costs uh, analysis. And uh, on the other hand, for the business as usual scenario, uh, we looked uh, so at the, the actions to rehabilitate the dike and re uh, rebuild the dike. Uh, and the investment costs uh, would be about 13 to 17 million euros for the dike. And for the spikes works, uh, it would be seven to 24 million euros. Um, and in terms of uh, maintenance costs, uh, the, the, the amount would be eight, uh, more than 8,000 uh, euros per year, 800,000 euros per year. So therefore, we looked at the costs and the benefits and tried to compare them, even though we, we don't have a, a, a monetary value of the, the benefits. Um, in order to evaluate whether or not it would be interesting to invest uh, in the NBS. And as you can see um, uh, on the NBS scenario, we assume that the costs of, uh, the, of, um, of uh, the, the Salines restoration were uh, really lower than uh, the costs of uh, a business as usual scenario and the benefits that uh, are generated uh, by the NBS scenario are really more um, uh, numerous and more diverse than in a business as usual scenario. And so that would uh, be a great argument uh, to uh, assume that it would be more interesting to invest in uh, the nature-based solution um, in terms of uh, environmental and socioeconomic uh, 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 criteria. So I will pass the the hand to Anne Sophie now. I think.
Sorry, it doesn't seem that I do have the hand uh, yet. I gave it back. And sorry, everyone, it's not working. So I will have to uh, stop sharing and, and share again. Apologies for the, the technicalities. Is it working now? Yeah, we can see presentation. But yeah. Is, is it okay? Um, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so now uh, the uh, last part of the presentation is um, to let you know a little bit on how you can actually communicate your results uh, from such study to key stakeholders. And that is not uh, really um, easy sometimes, uh, especially to policy decision makers. So why would you need actually to communicate uh, such results? Well, that can really um, help you highlight the benefits that people get from ecosystems and nature-based solution. Um, you can also raise awareness um, of people and policy decision makers and different other uh, actors, uh, such as policy decision makers as well and businesses uh, on the pressures generated by human activities uh, at your site, but also about the opportunity that bring a nature-based solution in, for instance, increasing uh, benefit values. And of course, decision makers um, and other um, businesses uh, can also prioritize from your results uh, sustainable management actions, for instance, such as natural-based solutions. So that can also attract investors. So um, we've seen that government and businesses um, may have, or now they really need to commit to actually invest in such um, actions and, and uh, solutions of, uh, um, based on nature. And they can also prioritize such fundings and allocate them to a relevant location as well. So what are the key elements to successful uh, communication? So first of all, you really need to have a clear communication strategy, um, and that needs to be actually implemented at the right beginning of your study. Uh, you can ask uh, communication officers that are uh, working with you to actually implement and know who uh, would be your audience, what kind of uh, message you need to convey, um, and how uh, you may want uh, to do that, so what kind of uh, communication materials and uh, what time frame you would need to, to do that for. Um, Chantal Ménard, who is our guest today, will uh, talk a, a bit more about the communication strategy later on. And the main thing as well is you need to tailor your messages to your audience. Um, so it means that you need to um, see what information is more important to your specific audience, um, what uh, do the results mean uh, to them? Uh, try to be less technical when you are uh, conveying your message. Uh, keep visual, be concise and clear in your uh, message. And so when you want to actually communicate to specific uh, stakeholders, and here we are looking at the policy decision makers, you need to be seen as credible, relevant, but also um, legitimate. Um, for them to actually consider your, your evidence. So um, there's a few points here. So try to synthesize and frame uh, your evidence um, so that can help you tailor it in the way that policy makers can understand it. And try to also communicate what you really want to obtain from uh, your, um, uh, your results. What do you try, what we're trying to achieve uh, for, your, for your site and do that in a proactive manner. So it means provide the relevant evidence to do so. Um, and know how much evidence is enough. Uh, don't try to provide too much evidence, otherwise your message is gonna be uh, diluted. Translate your findings a bit more effectively. Um, so try to be simple. Uh, you can talk in uh, figures, that's really the tangible outcomes um, of your um, study. So by, for instance, you can say by implementing um, a specific action, there will be an increase of a specific number of jobs. Uh, percentage of human rebuilding in a specific uh, area would be increasing by uh, certain percentages. Um, and for instance, the flood frequency uh, may be um, reduced by a certain number. Um, try as well to communicate the results and um, essentially uh, confidence of your, of your results to um, these policy decision makers. Um, and also 
uh, try to, as much as possible, to align your findings with the policy initiative. So it means also communicating your data at the right time. Um, so for instance, if um, policy decision makers have drafted a management plan and, and that needs to be amended from the achievement that you are looking for uh, at your site, then that would be uh, the good moment to actually um, uh, provide them with the results of your study. But the most important thing is also, as we've seen uh, at the first beginning of your study, is to engage those policy decision makers along the way of your, of your study. And so the key is, uh, I would be better uh, set uh, this communication if you understand how policy um, makers actually process evidence and the context in which they operate. And um, there is an article of uh, Kearney and Kia Poski, excuse me, the pronunciation, um, that provide a proper communication strategy within um, their uh, article. And it is shown at the uh, um, left side in, the, in this slide. And um, they provide a, um, a paper providing you with some steps of communication when it comes to communicate to uh, policy uh, makers using both policy, but also psychology uh, theories and um, studies. So it means the emotions and also values uh, related to communication. So I advise you to perhaps read it so it can give you more insights um, on how you can do communication to policy decision makers. Um, the uh, communication formats uh, that you can convey to policy decision makers, and that would be also the um, similar communication formats that you can provide to uh, businesses that are, uh, for instance, looking to um, achieve some specific targets, such as carbon neutrality or net zero, or even uh, net zero positive within their operations. And so here uh, you can write some um, policy brief or short summaries uh, to share findings and indicate policy relevance. Um, keep in touch through face-to-face -face meetings with those policy decision makers or email during the overall research uh, process. So here there's an example of um, um, a policy brief um, and you can see that there's text, but there's also uh, figures that is quite visual um, and there's calls to actions to actually prompt and policy decision makers to um, actually act and uh, achieve something for um, specific questions, for instance. Uh, you can also um, do some detailed structure abstract uh, if it is needed, um, present your results in meetings and be visual with uh, some maps uh, as well. So the message between uh, policy decision makers at the local and global level will be a bit different because they are looking at um, different things. Um, so for uh, local policy decision makers, the call for you would be to obtain a change towards um, either conservation or restoration of the site of interest you were uh, working at or new regulations. It's all about how your work contribute to your local future management or land use planning. So you will more communicate about um, detailed findings for your specific sites, express your key findings in figures, and these policy decision makers are more looking at um, what it means actually to people living in the area. Um, so they want to look at um, how much it would cost, the expenditures, um, and for instance, uh, what are the size of the area that would be uh, actually um, engaged and involved in changing something at the site. At the global level, policy decision makers, um, the goal would be more to actually raise awareness um, of tools or methods that actually work to tackle global issues. So how your work um, at your site contributes actually to a more global conservation objectives and, and planning their goals. So do you will need to communicate about more the importance of concepts or tools, but also methodology, um, or data systems, and you will use your um, case study at your site to illustrate uh, your uh, message to uh, these policy decision makers. So it's a notion of replicability of your work at a specific um, regional or national level. So for instance, a methodology that you may have used uh, that may uh, show um, something very important uh, to tackle degradation of, of um, um, wetlands, and that can be replicable replicated, sorry, at uh, more um, extrapolated at a, a larger scale. Um, just note that some globally, global policy makers uh, may know about some technicalities of concepts if they don't tell you um, that they are aware of uh, such uh, techniques and uh, just try to convey uh, a message that is uh, that, uh, kind of digestible for them uh, and try to keep your message 
uh, less complex. So what it means in terms of uh, communication formats, uh, so for the um, uh, policy decision makers at the local level, so they may be uh, you know, interested in cost benefit analysis about the return in investments uh, if you have to implement a net-based solution um, within the area. And so you can show in the graph, for instance, the um, monetary value for different ecosystem services between your uh, different states of your site. You can also show um, other services that may have been assessed uh, in a qualitative manner, uh, but try to be visual. So here it's quite clear in the, in the graph uh, that, uh, for instance, the restoration um, and sustainable practices uh, convey um, bigger um, cultural services uh, than just um, a statu quo, for instance. At the global level, um, you know, policy decision makers uh, may want to see some maps uh, where uh, you can see uh, here, so we provide some uh, two different examples. So the first one on, on coastal risks uh, index map that's been produced by um, our partner, um, um, METSI, that we work with um, in Verticolab. And they showed here at the Mediterranean Basin level um, a vulnerability um, to climate change um, of coastal areas within the overall Mediterranean Basin. So policy decision makers at the global level may be more interested in that so that they know uh, where it is more relevant to actually implement those natural-based solutions. It's kind of the, uh, the second map here um, that has been produced by uh, Tour uh, Duvela um, and um, they are producing a map um, also at the Mediterranean level on the restoration efforts and the costs of actually uh, doing such efforts. So now we have a poll. Um, for two minutes, I'm going to give the hand to Naima. Thanks, Anne-Sophie. Uh, so I just sent you a poll via Zoom, so you should have a pop-up window. We have uh, two little questions just to have an idea of your experience uh, with communicating. Um, so in a scale of one to 10, one being really easy and 10 almost impossible, how would you evaluate your experience in communicating your results to policy decision maker at a local level, but also at an international level? So I give you one minute uh, to answer. So. To repeat one, it's really easy, and 10 is almost impossible. Okay, so we have a, a few results coming in. I'm going to show you uh, the results that we had. So uh, as we can see, your answers for the local level is between four and eight, but around four or five. So I would say it's not too easy, but not too difficult to communicate at a local level your result. But it's nice to see that some of you have some better experience uh, with an eight, which is a very good grade. But um, for a global level, it's more mitigated, like the most of you would say four, which is not a great uh, rate, let's say. So we really hope that uh, with the, this webinar will help overcome these challenges, but also make sure to share your experiences and your challenges during our, dis our discussion at the end of the presentation, so we can uh, see what are the difficulties or what are the ideas that you have also to make this communication a lot easier. <clears throat> Back to you, Anne Sophie. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Naima. Um, so, continuing uh, on the communication uh, of your results, um, key stakeholders um, are also local communities. Um, you really need to um, provide your results because, um, of course, if you have, want to implement a net based solution, these people are actually living in the area. Uh, you need to build trust uh, with, uh, with them as well. So when you convey your message of your results, uh, be visual. Um, if you have someone who actually speak uh, the language, um, please um, try to present your results in their mother tongue. 
um, and for instance, try to also avoid uh, technical terms um, and build a narrative that they can actually understand. So ecosystem services in uh, some uh, communities is not really uh, understood. Um, so try to um, provide um, examples of more benefits of nature. So um, for instance, here you can show some photos, for instance, of what it means. Um, all the feedback uh, may be given through community meetings with uh, local groups um, to share and discuss um, the findings of your research. You can use a simple diagram or a simple map. Here's yeah, so the location of the ecosystem services. Um, you can also um, represent the value um, of your ecosystem services um, and also the implication of change uh, to these stakeholders. So that will really allow people to get ownership of the findings you convey and contribute to really what you really want to achieve um, at um, your site. So you can also provide them with some photos if those stakeholders were actually engaged uh, in the study. Um, for instance, uh, some um, drawing of ecosystem services within, within the area. So it's all about uh, building the trust with them as well. Um, and in terms of communication formats, um, so uh, as I said, you can uh, you know, do as much as possible community meetings, try to attend local events and uh, present the results to them. Uh, you can also post uh, your results to uh, social media. Uh, maybe some local communities have specific um, social network. Um, and we've seen that videos uh, are actually very key tools uh, to provide the message and specific results um, of uh, findings in a more uh, digestible way to local uh, communities. So try as well always um, either to use the um, specific uh, country language or uh, use subtitle uh, within uh, your videos. So the key message is really be visible. Uh, you will need to build your public profile and uh, networks. So think about what it means for people, what are the benefits to them, but um, also raise the awareness um, of unknown information uh, to them. Uh, and that's uh, also, um, you know, communicating these resources may increase the credibility, but also the, the uh, legitimacy uh, among policy uh, people. So, um, you may want also to um, keep up to date with emerging work in your field. So try to share experience with uh, colleagues and peers in your area. Um, but that also um, be a key thing to integrate your data to specific data systems or tools. So for instance, um, the Ecosystem Services Valuation Database uh, that had been funded by the Foundation for Sustainable Development um, refocused on gathering information uh, on um, economic values of ecosystem services, uh, so they are me measured in monetary units, um, and they have a um, lot of records of values over uh, 950 studies, if I'm not mistaken, um, at the moment distributed across all biomes, uh, ecosystem services, but also geographic regions. So by sharing uh, your data, your specific site to this kind of uh, database that can help also other people um, and colleagues of yours uh, that are working maybe in other regions um, um, and um, sorry, in, in the same regions, if they need to um, go back to it. Um, and you can also use this kind of database if you want to actually have uh, future projects um, in all the regions. Um, you will need to communicate uh, also in uh, from local journals to social media, use as much as possible uh, some specific networks. So we have Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook now. Um, I think everybody uh, know about them. Um, you know, try to also present um, videos or uh, webinars um, and try to share them in, in social media. Um, if you have published some scientific papers, try to uh, also share your results of those scientific papers in a more uh, digestible way. And you could, for instance, do some press releases uh, by um, having some uh, um, article written about uh, your uh, results, but in a less technical way. And you can have also um, some specific infographics about nature-based solution and the way uh, the increase uh, specific ecosystem uh, services, but in more visual uh, way to people. And now we have our uh, daily guest uh, and our guest sorry, of the day. Uh, so Chantal Ménard, who is a communication consultant, and she will uh, talk more details about uh, communication as she is an expert in this field. 
uh, the floor is yours, Chantal. Thanks, Anne Sophie. I have to say you did quite a great job. So I, I don't know how much I can add to what you what you shared. <laughs> Um, it was really, really interesting and important, all, all what you highlighted. I can imagine it can be a little bit overwhelming uh, because it requires lots of skills, uh, lots of uh, thinking, uh, and uh, it's not a case that uh, in communications you have communications experts, like you are experts in your area. This said, uh, I cannot be a scientist, or maybe you cannot be a communicator, but still we can find a space where we can use science and you can use communications. Um, and what I would like to, to, to do is build a little bit on, on what Anne-Sophie was saying. So um, the very first thing I would like to say is that communicating is, uh, first of all, an exercise of good sense. So what makes sense for you? Uh, means that you will be convinced about it and it means that you will be able to communicate it. So I think it's it's really important that you do not get scared by, oh my God, I have to do a strategy. Oh my God, I have to use this tool and that tool and that. I don't know how to do it. The really very first thing that, that is important is that you, you, you make sure you are uh, understanding uh, and willing um, to, to communicate uh, 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 your, your issue. So this, when you have it clear, you can have the support of someone or you can also build your, your skills. I will, I will give a, a point on this at the end of my, uh, of my speech. Um, so back to, to what Anne Sophie was saying, I think it's first, yes, very, very important to think uh, communications from the very beginning. And it's important to be extremely strategic. Um, and being strategic means first uh, to think about what makes sense, what you think is going to make a difference, what you have to say, how you want people to hear it and what you want to change. Uh, we are completely overwhelmed by communication uh, tools and devices and messages all day long. Uh, I think there's a very interesting data that I would like to share with you, which is that um, when my grandfather was reading a newspaper, I would read today 175 a day. So that's huge. So how do you make your space uh, in this in this load of information uh, it requires a lot of uh, strategic approach. And being strategic means understanding, as I was saying, uh, what you want to say and how you want to share it. But the very important thing is that you need to put yourself uh, in the shoes of who is going to receive the information. It's not about what you have to say, it's about what they have to hear. And to get there, uh, you will have sometimes, and I know how difficult it can be when you're a scientist, and I guess in the audience, we have more scientific people today. It means that you, you will have to give up on certain arguments, you will have to give up on maybe sometimes too many details, and you will have to think that to educate your audience, uh, and it's often the case with the policy people. I mean, I've had uh, conversations with policy people at the local level who tell me, I'm completely lost. I don't know how to do it. So the level sometimes is as basic as this. So you don't need to come, of course, having your studies and all your uh, um, materials is extremely important, but sometimes you don't need to come with the report like this, thinking that uh, the, the, the decision maker is going to read your, your, uh, your information. They are not going to read it. They will read it if you make it user friendly, attractive, and if you use their language. So this is really um, a first point that I, I wanted to, um, to highlight. Um, and uh, uh, a very important thing that Anne-Sophie was saying also is that you need to be clear and simple. Uh, you don't need to use the language that uh, makes sense to you. I know <laughs> sometimes for, for people in, a, in, in the, I mean, at policy level or in a, in a village, it, 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 it is too difficult for them to, to get there. So it's important that you adapt uh, to, to your audience. Then another very important thing is that although you will feel you're constantly saying the same thing, repeat, 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 repeat because uh, saying it once is never enough. So don't try to say too much. Focus on what you want to obtain as a result and think about how they need to hear it 
so that you generate the change. That is really, really uh, a fundamental thing. Um, think about maybe if they need some help, you know? So once you, once you see uh, people are interested by what you're saying, try to also constantly adapt. It's not that you have your strategy at the beginning of your project and then that's done and you roll it out. You will need to constantly adapt it also. Uh, another important point is that uh, it's key to involve your decision makers. So you have to be clever. <laughs> and sometimes uh, if you do, for example, a press release or if you know you have a journalist visiting your site, invite a local decision maker he will make a public declaration that you can use to applause for what, what he or she did, or you can also use it, you know, if they're not uh, uh, sticking to their commitment, you can absolutely say, hey, look what you declared on that day, and you're not there, you know, so you, you also can, can work out uh, this sort of uh, uh, public commitments that then you can use as a, as a, as a pressure tool. I mean, we're, we're talking about communication to push decision makers. Sometimes you will have to, to face that kind of, uh, of situations. Then it's good to write. It's good to talk on social media. It's good to do videos. It's good to do all the materials. But from my experience, I think nothing, and I know it's not always possible, but nothing pays more than taking them to the field. So if you can afford this, uh, organize a field trip, um, invite them, show them, spend time with them, because that's when you're going to be able to touch the, the human part, let's say, of the story, because you will be able to show them um, uh, what it means for you to work here. You will be able to share with them the concerns. There will be the local people uh, also uh, talking and, and meeting them. And I think this is really something I've never found any anything that is so powerful than, than this. Um, another approach you can use, of course, in your communications is that it's not necessarily you talking, but it can be also a person you have worked with who is concerned by the problem in the first place. And this person um, can be, uh, 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 let's say, can be uh, someone who gives sort of, I would call it peer-to-peer -peer communications. I know that in science you do peer reviews. If you use a Fisher to talk to a Fisher community, then you really make a big, a big difference. So in the same way, if you have a politician or a decision maker committed, you can invite him or her to come and share the, the experience. I know I have to finish, and I, I told you and Sophia would have too many things to say. <laughs> um, about the tools, don't try to be everywhere. That's really key. I mean, you don't need to be on all the social media. You don't need to have a website. You don't, sometimes you just need to focus on, on one message, one action, but do it 100%. And that's when you have success. So don't stress yourself with being everywhere and try to say everything. And the last point I wanted to make is that it's important if you feel you're not comfortable that you get trained. There are many uh, resources available or courses available uh, or people who can help you to speak in front of the camera, which is often the most difficult exercise. Um, and, and these resources often are uh, easily accessible, especially online today or at a, at a very uh, affordable cost for, for your organization. So that's it, I have to stop. I would like to say much more. <laughs> I hope that uh, what I've uh, added is, uh, is helping and I'm, I'm available if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chantal, for this very insightful presentation. As a communicator, I agree with all, uh, all the things you, you, you mentioned. And so there's, uh, there's a Chantal email on the screen, but I will also send it to you by email, just in case you have any specific questions or uh, if you want to follow up from her presentation. So now we're going to take questions. Uh, so uh, if you have any question, you can again, either raise your hand or put it on the chat, but you can also share your experience. We would love to hear, for example, for the people that uh, uh, answer the poll, like what were the difficulties you had communicating with policymakers, or if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to, to speak.
So just in case you need some inspiration to, to speak, we in the screen you have a few questions you can ask yourself to, or you can ask us, or you can, yeah, to, to share your experience. So for example, what are the challenges do you foresee to do such studies on what sort of tools would you need to do your assessment? Talking about uh, NBS project or uh, talking about key stakeholders. Um, are you currently consulting with your key stakeholder about this type of projects? Um, so please feel free to take the floor. Hi again, uh, it's Costas. I have a few questions um, or, or co and comments I can make. Um, first of all, something from my experience is that um, <clears throat> it's probably more difficult to talk with and convince local stakeholders and politicians especially than international ones because usually uh, international politicians and stakeholders uh, whom you may reach um, have some level of knowledge that is relevant uh, or some other experience and that's why you reach them. Um, when you try to talk with uh, local politicians and especially in places um, where the politics is generally at a low level of understanding as for environmental issues, it's certainly difficult and you have to face a lot of uh, prejudice, perhaps uh, certainly <clears throat> lack of knowledge, basic knowledge. And so you have to explain everything and uh, ha have to address the preoccupations people may have in mind. Uh, they may have been misled by what they have heard or read here and there. And so you have to make a real effort to explain um, even the most basic approaches. <clears throat> in, so in my experience, uh, you know, I've tried uh, mostly with local politicians um, and I found it difficult. Um, one attempt at the European Parliament was uh, more encouraging uh, because people there, my explanation is that because the, the politicians there uh, deal with a lot of environmental legislation and we are at a, at a time of history for the EU when uh, it's, it's a leading uh, political entity um, in the world as for environmental legislation, so you find uh, more open ears there. Now, as for implementing uh, some strategies and the uh, nature-based solutions, uh, I have tried um, a few years ago to make a start with evaluating some local ecosystems here on the island of Corfu, but I didn't move forward exactly because uh, I didn't exactly know how. Um, and because specifically because we did not have data and I did not know where to look for the data, um, even though the methodology I would generally um, make uh, as was presented, uh, having in mind the, a, a common methodology for cost and benefit analysis. Uh, but I, I still find hard uh, or feel hesitant about uh, what data to include in order to make it a credible analysis. Um, so, for example, as for the carbon capture potential of a small coastal wetland or of Posidonia Oceanica. Uh, what values do you use? Uh, what other factors do you take into account? In fact, I, I'm happy to report that for this, for one of these cases of uh, nature areas that I have in mind, we were able to uh, fund um, study to estimate the carbon capture uh, that the, the Posidonia Valley uh, uh, produces there. Uh, so we will have some numbers as for that. But for the rest, so for the wetlands and the surrounding ecosystem, uh, I'm still a bit in the dark. So any indication uh, about where to look for specific information is more than welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gustav, for sharing your experience. Uh, it's very interesting to see how you have uh, 
a harder time communicating to local uh, to local um, policymakers that are more involved in what's going on. Um, but uh, I don't know if Anne Sophie or Selma, do you have any recommendation of where Costas can find more information, more data? Yeah, I, I would. I was quite interested in in knowing a bit more of uh, your location and what kind of projects you were actually uh, working on. Um, I'd be quite interested to to know. Um, for the specificity on um, the ecosystem services that you wanted to actually assess within the um, habitats that you had in your um, coastal ecosystem, um, so we. We've started a, a MAVAP funded project with um, two um, partners, so um, in Spain, um, so about life, and um, also uh, in Sardinia, uh, METSI. And um, the METSI partner has started uh, also an assessment of um, global climate regulation for Posidonia. And uh, it is, you know, they, they've tried to retrieve some um, figures in published studies. And it's, I know it's not, it's not always um, easy to do so. Um, and sometimes this kind of marine ecosystems um, may not be um, really um, assessed yet uh, in this type of, of country or region. Um, and I'd be quite interested to actually, you know, once you have your results, or maybe you do already have your results, it's actually to, um, to, to show and see your, your findings and, and to, in a reply to your second questions about how to do your, your assessment in other um, ecosystem um, that you, you have at your site, uh, there's some tools um, that are actually uh, available. So we put on the on the chat the um, toolkit for ecosystem um, service site-based assessments, which we provide you um, with a step-by-step -step guidance on how you can um, assess your ecosystem services at the site scale. Um, in uh, if you want in different scenarios, so you're not obliged to, um, and it provides you with uh, different ecosystem services that you may want to actually assess, and especially um, wetlands, for instance, is one um, key ecosystem that the toolkit is uh, actually uh, looking at. So um, you may want to have a look um, at this specific toolkit. It really depends on the, of course, the scale that you are working at, but it provides practical methods on how you can do this. Um, and of course, it looked at the uh, approach of um, you know, um, benefits against the, the costs of delivery of the ecosystem uh, services. Um, so um, if you have more uh, questions, you know, we are more than happy to um, answer those in more details in an email, for instance, um, and uh, that we can also uh, share our uh, experience. I hope um, I answered your, your questions, but please come back uh, to us if, um, if I didn't. Yes, thank you. I think you answered. I'll, I'll definitely have a good look at those uh, links. Um, and if you want more information about the analysis, I'm, I'm happy to send you the analysis when it's ready, which should not take much longer, I believe. Uh, but if you want more details um, about the area I referred to, um, I can explain now or I can write you an email later, or whatever you prefer. Could you just add to the audience where you are actually um, working? So um, um, these um, so right now I'm not working. I but I have been active. I was uh, leading an environmental organization for in the last couple of years, the Ionian Environment Foundation, also for the islands in the west side of Greece. And one of the projects was a campaign to protect an area called Eremitis on the northeast of the island of Corfu from a destructive uh, construction project. Uh, they, they were aiming to make it a resort. So we started doing surveys, helping the campaign, like the, the activism sides of it, but also uh, the scientific side in order to, to get the data we need uh, in order to achieve protection. So within that um, is the analysis for the Posidonia Meadow plus some other uh, biodiversity surveys um, we, we have done. Um, and we're trying to build up the whole picture of this area. But there are also some other, and, and there are three coastal wetlands in that area. That's why it's of interest to this discussion. But we also have some big wetlands on the south side of the island, uh, which are definitely worth 
a proper analysis for. So I'd be interested in uh, working with some colleagues on that um, as well um, in the summer, from the starting from the summer. Thank you very much. Yeah, that'd be um, quite useful to actually share experiences. So looking forward to um, to actually um, talking to you via email. Great, thank you. And I'll give you the link of the area I spoke about uh, first. I'll put it on in the chat. Naima, is there any other um, questions? Or? Yes, so we have a question from Maria Antonova who asks, is there a way for coastal restoration projects to sell carbon credits on the voluntary market right now? It seems there, there isn't a way to certify projects on seagrass or salt marshes in Europe yet. So uh, we actually don't have the answer, but Jane, so a participant, uh, sent, uh, just sent a link. So I hope, um, Maria, uh, this is useful for you. Let us know if, uh, because I, I don't think that anne Sophie and Salma have the answer to this question, but maybe we can look into it and follow up by email. But do let us know if this link was useful. I'm looking at the question now. Yeah, um, um, unfortunately, I. I uh, both then and I are not really experts in, in um, voluntary markets, uh, but I'm hoping that the answer that Jane, and thank you so much uh, for sending through the uh, this answer. Um, I, I can see there's a, a follow-up um, messages between the, the two of you. Um, that's that's the, the great thing with with webinar. Um, you can always uh, find people who have uh, actually the answer. Maybe share uh, together your um, email addresses uh, in private if you want to, um, if that may be useful. So, is there any other questions, experience you would like to share? Yeah, and Sophie. Yeah, maybe I would like uh, simply to to reinforce one of the message that uh, either you or, or Selma highlighted in terms of communication strategy, and which is uh, what information is more important to your specific audience. Actually, in the in the Camargue case study that Selma presented, we've had uh, uh, big problems having uh, the message uh, get through the, the local people, probably because at the beginning, what we did not understand is by restoring these wetlands, by letting the, the dike in front of the sea uh, gradually die and be eroded and the sea uh, take uh, the, the land inside. Uh, we forgot that for the people in the nearby villages, for them it meant the sea coming closer to their houses and being afraid of it. And so we probably overlooked uh, this dimension in the first uh, communication and we had uh, quite a lot of trouble with local uh, opposition. So now it's being corrected, but uh, this illustrates uh, very well why it is important to, to be able to understand the, 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 the local people. Uh, thank you for, for sharing your experience. Uh, and I mean, as uh, Chantal said, we always learn. Uh, so if you, you realize that you missed something on the first communication and you adapt it on the next one, and that's I think what's the most important part Communicating, even if you have a strategy from the beginning, don't be afraid to adapt it and to change if you see that the results are not what you expected. Um, is there any other questions or intervention or we can wrap it up? Costa uh, just sent us the link, wait, I'm gonna share it with all of you, the link to the site he mentioned. I'm gonna share it on the chat. So I see there's not uh, any other questions. So uh, thank you very much for joining this webinar. We really hope you enjoyed it and that you learn about uh, the methodolog methodolog methodological <laughs> approach to perform a cost benefit analysis of uh, nature-based solutions. So uh, we will have a third and final webinar uh, in June, 2022. Uh, so the final date is still to be confirmed, uh, but you can already register via the link I will put in the chat uh, right now. And you will be informed as soon as the, the date is final. 
We also have two upcoming publications, as you can see on the on the screen. So a guideline um, on the economics of nature-based solution made by uh, Vertigolab and BirdLife International, and a policy brief uh, created by Vertigolab, IUCN, and BirdLife uh, International as well. That will be shared with you as soon as they're ready. But these guidelines will be uh, promoted during the webinar three. So be sure to join us and learn more, more, learn more about uh, that. Sorry. Um, we also have some updates coming for TESA. So TESA is the toolkit for ecosystem service um, site-based assessment um, that enables conservation practitioners, land managers, and business uh, to assess ecosystem services and to value them in a monetary but also non-monetary terms using a step-by-step -step guidance with practical methods. So a new version of the toolkit should be released at the very end of 2022, but you can download the version 2.0. So I reshared the link again on the chat and I will share it with you again uh, with the follow-up email after the webinar. And I also added a link with more information about TESA so you can have uh, a look at it as well. We will send also the recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint presentation via email. And uh, thank you very, very much for joining. Uh, I hope you really enjoyed it and have a lovely, lovely afternoon, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Bye-bye.